All right, guys, we're going to talk about um, a couple things for this. This is actually yesterday, but I want to bring it up because a lot of people get stuck trying to predict this kind of move. You know, how can I be on the team and short, or at least not long, but maybe short and catch a great move like this from 20 even in the S&Ps all the way down to 11, right? How could you catch that? So let's rewind it. First of all, you got to get yourself anticipating and having a bearish bias. And one way is to compare and contrast. And you hear me say a lot in these videos, what is another market doing? So look at these top two charts here. The NASDAQ is on the right, and this is the S&P on a 4 PNF on the left. This is a 10 PNF point figure NASDAQ, 4 PNF S&P. And so let me pull up some illustrations to show you what I mean. If you look at this market, from around 8.30 on the open, and I draw an arrow up, there they make highs right after the open. So this arrow and yellow vertical line is the same right in here, okay? Those two vertical arrows happened at the same time. The ES made a higher high right after the open, and pretty much the NASDAQ did too. All of a sudden, if you drill down in and look a little closer, to this area I want to bring your attention to. We make a higher high right after the U.S. Open, and then we make another higher high. They flush it back up, okay? So you expect the NASDAQ to do the same, but it doesn't. It's staying below its high. Remember, this high in the NASDAQ is this high over here. What's different when the S&P make a higher high there, the NASDAQ's over here, underneath its high. You, you begin to accurately assess that one's weaker than the other. But you can't do that if you just looked at one. You got to compare and contrast, just like a car dealership. I tell the story. How do you know that that char car is expensive? Because all the other dealerships are selling the same car for $2,000 less. You begin to find value. So, Compare, contrast, the intermarket relationships concept have to be understood to develop your skill. So if that begins to get you bearish, less bullish, bearish, because you're looking for downside, you can then look for order flow in a footprint or edge zones as I've developed to show you when buyers come in and it can't go up. Remember a repeated thing I say throughout my videos, conventional wisdom throughout the window or flipping around. If you want to follow conventional wisdom, you'll follow the high failure rate of this business. What's conventional wisdom? When you see buyers buy it, when you see sellers sell it, flip it around. When you see a rush of buyers and it goes up, good, it's supposed to. When you see a rush of buyers and it can't go up, it's the when moment that the weakness is going to ensue. So when you're trying, let's blow this chart up. When you're trying to catch this big move lower, what can you see in here at the beginning of it? to get you on the team for a long move down. Whether you catch it or not, if it keeps you off the wrong side, saving money is like making money. If it gets you to execute your bearish idea, all of a sudden you go from knowing how it feels when you hesitate, you miss a short and you end up chasing it and you get it down in here. How many feel like that? You're always chasing, you're always chasing. You want to be able to see and anticipate. The only way you could catch moves early on is to anticipate well. Compare, contrast, and order flow. So let, let me play this. Let me play this back real quick and show you what comes in that gives you a probability that the downside might be the right side. Always remember something. If you want a high level of exactness, go become an engineer or a chemist. As a trader, you want probabilities. You want to stack them. You want to remove them. You want your opinions to be uh, less random and not feel like a guess. So you got to stack probabilities and not try to be exact. Stack without being exact. Chemists, engineers, they have to be exact or the building falls down. As traders, we just want to lay out scenarios and probabilities and say, hey, listen, be careful long because buyers are coming in and it can't go up. Makes sense, right? So let's see it play out with these edge zones. It's taken a little while to load. And now I got to go back because we just missed it. Let me go back a minute and rewind it. 
just to lay this story up, you're getting higher highs in the S&P E-minis, but the NASDAQ is weakening up. The NASDAQ will not make higher highs. It should begin to get you to scratch your head that the market could continue to go up because its cousin, the NASDAQ, is showing you some weakness. It's just harder to continue a rally. So then you overlap order flow and you put yourself in a position to find better win moments. So you hesitate less, you miss less, you take less avenge trades, you chase less, you minimize being right and losing money. How many people are right and lose money? You know, because you, you picked a bad location. So let's get this thing to load up here. We just missed some of the buying that came in, couldn't go up. Now let's see if this is it. Right in here, you see two things. You see aggressive sellers that came in. Look at the right side. And aggressive buyers that come in. So live in the room, I'm already building out the story to the room in this analysis that there's a divergence between the NASDAQ and the ES and that there's a miniature fight between aggressive sellers and buyers and below 19 even, look out. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say I predicted the whole move down to 11. I just predicted the weakness, the beginning of the weakness. Let's play it. In fact, let's play it at one-to-one -one speed here. So there's the green buying that comes in aggressively. It's an imbalance buy at 19 even. And as the market, this is going real time. As the market's going, it's starting to sink below it a little bit, 1875, 18 half. And it's like, this isn't random. As soon as it got below those 19 evens where the buying came in, weakness ensued. And let me pause it again and speed it up. Let me sit here and watch it the same same speed. But you, you get the gist that the market is not always going to be super predictable. Let me pause it again. Because you see when the selling came in, but it went down? That's what you want to see. Now, if that selling came in, it just hung here for 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Then you're probably going to get a pop. The point I'm trying to make is, is that when you have um, – when you get into this business, and I talk about this, one of the weaknesses you go to right away is you see a chart and you're like, how can I get long here and sell it here, long here, sell it up here, sell it again, short up here, cover it down in here, looking for big moves and how to predict big moves. Big moves happen because most people didn't predict them. Write that down. Big moves happen because most people aren't predicting them. If most people are predicting a rally, it can't go up because most people are long, therefore trying to sell their long position. So big moves happen because most people didn't predict them. Don't try to only predict big moves. I compare it to baseball. You're foul tipping pitches until you could catch a pitch you can handle. So I could continue to play this out, but you see the weakness in two. So just remember two things. Number one, market relationships. The NASDAQ showed you weakness. And number two, buying came in, and it could not do what? Could not go up, and it should. And that was right here at 19 even. And it slipped a little below it. And live in the room, we said, be careful long. And if you're bearish, this is a spot to take a shot. Again, not predicting it's going to go all the way to 11. But it's always the definition of a good location is to have the market go your way sooner rather than later. Subscribe to our videos. Leave comments if you like it. Don't subscribe if you don't. Good luck, everyone. I hope you enjoy the videos.